Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and today I'm going to be taking you through Candida albicans infections. It is a fungal infection um, that's often overlooked, um, even though it's responsible for a surprisingly large number of deaths every year. Here we can see this patient has a, a terrible infection of the esophagus going down here, and these white lumps there are uh, clumps of Candida albicans fungus. Now, I'll take you through this in more detail. So first, let's have a look at global deaths per year. Are we overlooking fungus or am I overstating it? So E. coli, 250,000 deaths a year, mostly through uh, diarrhea. Uh, influenza, around 600,000, 500,000 deaths per year, often through respiratory failure, that kind of thing. Malaria, um, around about 400,000 deaths per year. Staphylococcus, it's a bit bigger, 650,000 deaths a year, that kind of thing. Where are fungal infections on this list? Over 1.5 million deaths per year. Yet, we've heard of all of those previous four, but not many people are talking about the role fungal infections play in it. Um, which is really hot, hot, which is really not good. We, we are overlooking this problem, uh, particularly uh, the global awareness of it, of the general population of fungal infections as a problem, um, is really overlooked. Now, just for perspective, because I know some people don't think COVID-19 is that important. Where does COVID-19 fit on this graph? It's over 4 million a year. So, uh, yeah, it's not a conspiracy, guys. This pandemic is a real problem and it's blowing these other pathogens out of the water. Anyway, let's continue. Um, so let's meet Candida albicans. This is what it looks like. Now it's dimorphic. It can form these uh, hyphae-like structures. They're not quite hyphae. Um, and yeast cells. These are called pseudo hyphae. There's a number of differences that distinguish pseudo hyphae from hyphae. My favorite one is um, a, a good way to understand the difference by it is that a pseudo hyphae can kind of grow and branch and divide from anywhere in the uh, uh, root like structure, the stem like structure that it is, whereas a proper hyphae only grows from the ends, right? A lot like a plant or a root. Um, that's a proper hyphae, whereas a pseudo hyphae can sort of bud off in any direction. So it, it, it is sort of halfway between a hyphae and a yeast cell. Now, on the surface of the skin, while it's invading it, it prefers to be in the hyphae state. Now, um, pseudomembranous uh, infections are uh, forms of Candida albicans infections that affect the surface of cells. It's called pseudomembranous because it kind of forms a membrane over the infection. Although it's not a full membrane, it's kind of rough. It's a pseudomembrane over the candida infection. Now, it likes warm and moist areas. So it likes the mouth, which causes thrush. It likes the vulva and the vagina, which causes yeast infections. And it likes other moist regions, such as diaper rash or under the armpit. Um, now, it forms a biofilm. Now, this biofilm is mostly made out of all the stuff you find in the cell wall. Um, glucans, mannose proteins, other uh, glycosylated proteins, and other complex carbohydrates. But they're often less rigid. They are less rigid. So that's why it's it's not like a rigid cell wall. It's more like an extension of the, uh, a fluidy kind of version of the cell wall. It does a lot of things. It protects it from drying out. from the um, So it enables a moist environment which promotes cell division. But it can also prevent it from being detected or attacked by our immune system. So these biofilms are amazing. We often associate them with things like Staphylococcus aureus, but it is also involved in um, these uh, in, in Candida albicans, and that's that pseudo membrane. It's not quite a membrane, like it doesn't have a rigid surface, it's more like a jelly, which is why it's called a pseudo membrane. And that's that biofilm that exists over it. Uh, what it then does next, and this is why it's a disease and not just some happy thing sitting on us. Now, I should mention it's an opportunistic disease, so we will often have candida albicans all over our skin and in our mouth. But under normal situations, if we're healthy and we have a good balance of microbes on our body, it's not a disease agent. If we get immune compromised, or we are young, or we are old, um, or we get dysbiosis, and we get a mismanagement of the microbes. Perhaps we have too few of some of the good microbes. It allows the expansion of candida albicans. And this is when it becomes a disease. So this is when it will fill, form that biofilm. It will grow to a level that's damaging. And they will start to release digestive enzymes. Now, one of the main digestive enzymes they release are proteases, which is a protein ase. Anything with an ase is an enzyme. So proteinase. Um, 
uh, proteases are protein ases are enzymes that digest proteins and our skin is mostly made out of keratin so it's a good thing to produce which is a protein uh, because it can digest through our skin but also there's proteins everywhere in our body so it's a great uh, way to eat us basically and this is what our fungus do in the soil they secrete digestive enzymes they turn the soil a little bit to a soup and then they absorb it through this uh, wall um, here we have uh, an, an affected vulva, vulva, and you can see the, the white pseudomembranous um, colonies, and that's that biofilm there. Here we see a nappy rash, um, and this one's very red, suggesting inflammation. It suggests the immune system is fighting this right now. Um, and here we have a tongue that has a very severe infection, and you can see that pseudomembrane, that biofilm, that white carbohydrate jelly that's coating that tongue. Um, very horrible infections when you get it. Uh, but it's reasonably treatable. You can typically use a topical uh, treatment, a topical cream. Now topical means on a surface, so you could just rub it um, if it's on the skin like that nappy rash. Um, but it becomes a real problem when it becomes systemic, when it gets into a blood system. Now that's called candidemia. So emia means blood. If you think about anemia or anemic, means no blood. Um, so if you have no blood, you're anemic. And you can check that by pulling down that and seeing if it's pale. It's a good sign that you're anemic, um, although that's not a very good scientific test, but it is just a, it's what doctors are looking for when they pull down your eye or your lip like that. Um, but so candidemia means candida albicans or candida other species in your blood. Um, and so this can happen a few ways. It could digest its way down to a capillary, um, which uh, is very easy in the mouth or vulva. It's a little bit harder through the skin. And then it can release yeast cells into the bloodstream. And that's when you can see why it wants to be dimorphic. The yeast cells are good from getting from one person to another because they're more robust, they're single cells, they can go off and float, um, and also getting around your body, right? The yeast cells are better at that. They're more of an invasive thing. But when it's found something that it likes and it wants to build a strong colony on, that's when it will turn into the pseudo-hyphae pseudo morphology, okay? So that's why it's dimorphic. But on rare occasions, chunks of hyphae can even flow into the capillary. Now that happens rarer, it would have to be a very bad infection that's dissolved some of the blood vessels through, the, through those enzymes, digested some of the blood vessels through those enzymes, but it can happen. Now what can happen next, so this is candidemia, what can happen next is invasive candiditis. Um, uh, now, uh, this is when candida ends up where it shouldn't. So a good example is in a joint, which typically has a low immune presence, so it could flourish inside a joint, but it could also end up in a kidney or in a heart valve or somewhere very dangerous like that. And that is when it can really uh, uh, cause death. Another huge problem, which I'll go into when I cover the immune system, is if it's in your blood, you can end up with a systemic inflammatory response, which can be very dangerous. Um, high, high body temperatures, um, a loss of fluid as your blood system becomes very leaky, um, it, it's a very dangerous situation to be in, have, to have any sort of systemic infection. So how do we kill it? Uh, we definitely know it's a problem, how do we kill it? And when you look at these two cells, uh, this is probably what our cells look like, a eukaryote cell with no cell wall. This is what a fungal uh, cell looks like, and it has a cell wall. So we need some sort of selective toxicity. So we need some way to target something that's unique in the fungal cell that's not unique in the human cell, right? So we need to look at the molecules in the fungus that aren't in the human cells, and that's something we might be able to target with a drug and to get our selective toxicity. That's the key to selective toxicity. What is molecularly different between these organ organisms that is crucial to its survival that we can attack? And we found a couple. I'm going to go through one. One of the defining features of animals, of all animals from beetles to humans, is cholesterol. Um, and we produce cholesterol in our liver. This is what statins, the drug, inhibits. So we produce cholesterol, and cholesterol has a huge importantly, important role in our body. Um, it's involved in uh, membrane rigidity, and it's involved in creating structures within our membrane. Our membrane isn't um, uniform across the cell. There are structures within it, and cholesterol is critical to the formation of those structures within a membrane. And it is a defining feature of animals. Fungus have, don't have cholesterol, but they have another molecule that takes its place called ergosterol. And ergosterol does exactly what cholesterol does, but it's just the fungal form of it. 
So now we have a molecular difference between us and the fungus. We have something we can target with drugs. And that's what we've done. So azole drugs are a group of compounds, um, and there's a large group of them uh, that block the function of an enzyme that produces ergosterol. So an enzyme goes to produce, as in, enzymes are involved in all biological processes, basically. And so enzymes are involved in the production of ergosterol. If we inhibit that enzyme that creates ergosterol, they end up with no ergosterol, which means they lose that critical function in biology of having control over your cell membrane and what it does and how it interacts with the environment and the structures within it, and it kills them and it prevents their growth. So you find a molecular difference and you target it molecularly. And that's how we, um, and that's how we end up with selective toxicity. And this fungus uh, example is a great example. So up next, I'm going to take you through a connection between yeast and cancer. And no, that's not that yeast causes cancer. It's how researching yeast, regular old baker's yeast, help us, helped us answer really important questions around cancer.